people in September. The reason, the reason that Pastor Amosa thought that I look so young tonight wasn't because of me. He saw this good-looking woman standing next to me. He said, oh, look how young he is. Yeah, that's what it was. That must have been it. <laughs> She's a blessing. We've been married for 47 years, and uh, we're still in love. She's still my best friend. And she is so thrilled to be here this weekend with you at Trinity Baptist Church. You're family to us, so God bless you. All right, y'all take a seat tonight. Hallelujah. Well, what a joy it is to be with you once again. And uh, been looking forward to this opportunity. And uh, seriously, Carrie decided that uh, 2023 was going to be a year of uh, increased travel for her. And she knows my typical schedule. Um, I have responsibilities in a local church back home, but also oversee a network of churches and ministers and, and have some international friends and relationships that we uh, are always wanting to be a part of. And so next month, uh, this month we wanted to be here with you. Next month we'll be in Cape Town, South Africa together for a week, uh, taking some of our leaders there to minister with friends in South Africa. So this is a year of much travel. We're excited about it. So glad that God gives us the energy, puts fuel in our tank, amen, and keeps us moving for him. So uh, it's a pleasure to be with you once again. Looking forward to tomorrow and uh, Sunday morning, of course, as well. But tomorrow we'll have a, um, an important seminar and focusing on this theme of the 360 degree leader, what that means. We'll explain it more tomorrow. And Pastor asked if tonight and Sunday morning I would just be a little bit more general in the ministry of the word, the message for tonight and for Sunday morning. So uh, let's uh, pray right now and then we'll open up the word of God together. Father, we are truly blessed to be your people. We are blessed tonight to be able to join hearts with you, hands with one another to have our faith and confidence in the word of God increase. Lord, as these seeds of truth are deposited tonight, whether we have been following you for one month or one year or 10 years or 50 years, let it be fresh manna for us. Feed us and minister to us. Let it be life in blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, I understand that this year has, was declared by your senior pastor as a year focusing on the Bible, the Word of God. Amen? So I'm sure that you've heard a number of messages on that theme during the course of the year. Uh, but tonight and Sunday morning, I want to focus my message building on that theme. I'm going to speak to you about God's amazing promises how many of you know that the Bible is full of promises? There's over 7,000 promises in the Bible. Can you believe it? I, I'm certain of this, that while you may know the Bible pretty well, none of us have claimed all of those promises yet. There's still something left for you to discover and to grow in. And so tonight, I'm going to speak to you on the subject of God's amazing promises for identity. For identity. Get into that in just a moment. Sunday morning... Tell your friends and neighbors, we're going to be talking about God's amazing promises for your future. God has a future for every one of us. We're going to dig into that on Sunday morning. I know it'll be a rich time of studying together. But tonight, we're going to talk about God's amazing promises for our own identity. Did you know that your sense of well-being in life is directly connected to your identity and to how? You feel about yourself, how you view yourself, how you see yourself. Yes. Knowing what God thinks and says about who you are is the key to living a life well-lived, a life of abundance, and a life of significance. About three years ago, just before the pandemic, I was traveling. It was actually, yes, it was in March of 2020 right before the pandemic hit. I was in South Africa, and uh, 
I'd traveled to this particular hotel many times, and so I was familiar with the staff. But I had my bags and my luggage with me that the uh, valet uh, had carried inside the hotel for me, and they had put it on a cart right beside the, the front desk of the hotel. I went through the protocols of checking in and uh, showed them my passport, gave them all of my identification, and I put all my things back in the bag, and uh, they said, uh, the front desk person said, Dr. Hill, you need to go ahead and have your breakfast now because it's only going to be available for the next few moments, and we'll hold your bags here in, the, uh, in this special secure area. When you get done with breakfast, then we'll take you to your room. I said, that's fine. I went into the restaurant, had breakfast, came back. They took my bags up to my room. And uh, as I was unpacking, by the end of the day, I had noticed that something was missing. That someone had uh, gotten into my private uh, computer bag, my personal bag. Normally, I never leave that anywhere. But on that day, for some reason, I was probably jet lagged. But anyway, I left it there. And when I got into that bag, my passport was stolen, as well as some money and some credit cards. And immediately, you know, when you have something like that that's really important to you stolen, you immediately begin to dig through everything you have. You're like, it's got to be here somewhere. And I looked and I looked and I looked. And all of a sudden, it dawned on me, ah, for 30 minutes, that bag was in the hands of someone else that I don't know. And although they said it would be secured, that's what happened. That must have been where I lost my passport. I can't tell you, uh, you know, when you, you, if you're traveling and you're in another country and you're dependent upon your identification to get back into your country, and in that case, in four days, I was going to have to have my passport in hand or I would never be allowed to leave South Africa. And while I have many friends in South Africa, I wanted to get home. And I couldn't get home without my identity proven. It wasn't enough for me just to say, I'm a U.S. citizen, my address, my phone number, all my friends. No, they wanted proof of identity. Immediately, I called the U.S. Embassy there in Cape Town, South Africa, and I said, what must I do? My passport's been stolen. They began to give me a description of everything I needed to do, sent me to a website and said, you must do all these things. For the next day and a half, which was supposed to be rest time to get ready for the ministry that I have at that conference, all I could do is run errands to get photographs, to secure documentation, to prove that I was who I said I was. You wouldn't believe how much trouble. I had to drive way onto the other side of Cape Town, find the embassy, sit in the waiting area. I waited there for two hours. Then I gave them my information. I had to wait another two hours for them to process it. And then finally was able to get a copy, a certified copy of my passport. They issued me a new temporary passport. All of that trouble for one reason. Because I lost my identity. I knew who I was. But I needed to have something substantial, documentation, proof for the U.S. government to allow me to enter into the country. I was reminded through that experience how critical your identity is. Many of you have heard stories. More recently, it's become more common. But it is, there are people who actually make a living by stealing others' identity. You have to be extra cautious today. Because there are people looking to steal, particularly with the internet and the common use of uh, of online things, there are people who are interested in stealing your identity. And then you really have problems. So, I want to talk to you tonight about knowing your identity and what God's Word has to say about it. So, if I ask you the question, how do you 
really know who you are. You can tell me, but do you have proof? Do you know what the proof is of the one and only source of all truth, which is the word of God? Do you know what God says about who you really are? Tonight's message, we're going to focus on your true identity. If you're a child of God, if you're a born again believer, we're going to focus on that. And those aspects of God's word are going to inform us and help us to embrace our identity, hopefully in a fresh way. And I believe that this has the potential tonight, this message of changing your life. So first of all, let's, uh, we will uh, try to move ahead here to give you some, uh, uh, some help. Let me see, where am I going to hold this tonight? I can't remember where you're, uh, which direction am I going to click tonight? Huh? No direction. <laughs> okay. Well, then y'all will have to advance it on my behalf. Thank you for that. First of all, I ask you the question, what is identity? What does it mean? Let me give you an explanation. Your identity is who you see yourself as. Who we experience ourselves to be. Someone once said is, your identity is the I each of us carries on the inside of us. The I that you carry on the inside of you. Did you know that over the course of your life, particularly over your younger years, that your identity, your personal identity was being formed? It was being shaped. Shaped by your parents. Shaped by your family. Shaped through your own experiences, relationships. Your identity has been shaped by your culture. Your identity has been shaped by even the influences on your life, like the influences of the media, influences of the world, influences from your friends. <clears throat> we are constantly seeking to define who we are, what we can connect to. Oftentimes, we each feel pressure in our lives from other people. We'll feel pressure from people to define ourselves through things like your job, how much money you make, your successes, your grades in school, even your appearance. People will pressure you to view yourself through the grid of even things like what kind of clothes you wear, what other people say about you, and through other means. Have you ever noticed if you talk to someone and maybe you're just getting acquainted, and many times you can say, well, tell me about yourself. If someone said that to you, what would be the first thing you would say? It's interesting that we live in a world in which most of our answers would not be who we really are. But we'd be telling them what? If they said, well, tell me about yourself. Hopefully some of us would think, well, I'm married. I have two children. I have four grandchildren. But instead, most of us think about what? What we do, not who we are, but what we do. Oh, I work in a bank. Oh, I work for this corporation or I do this. You're telling people what you do, how you spend your time, but you're not explaining who you really are. But unfortunately, we, our lives have been uh, framed by our experiences, good and bad. So. Knowing our identity is very, very important. Did you know that discovering your true identity as God sees it is maybe the most important thing about changing your life for Jesus Christ? I want to share with you some ways that that can be helpful for you. One of the most important revelations that we can ever receive from the word of God is to understand who we are in Christ who you are in Christ. The Bible will tell you who you are. That's what we need to learn, God's promises regarding who we are, identity. In our everyday lives, we identify, many of us identify with uh, a person we know, a person that we admire. We might have our primary identity with an organization. Again, maybe it's with your career. Your 
everyday identity may be uh, your nationality. Or maybe even it's the sports team that you follow. Where is your identity based? You know, you've heard, I'm sure, of uh, different areas, particularly urban areas, that have a problem with gangs, right? So groups of people that, uh, young people in particular, they, they join together and frequently are not doing good things and committing all kinds of crimes and taking advantage of things. Do you know what most gang members will explain is the reason that they're in a gang is because that's where they get identity. They'll actually have a tattoo or wear a certain kind of a cap that connects to the gang that they're a part of. Why? Because everyone is looking for identity. Everyone wants to find some way to get identity. Some people uh, are find being a graduate of a particular university as something that they hold very close and very proud of, and their identity is with that school. And they're, you know, you ask them about it, and they'll immediately tell you, oh, yes, I graduated from this university or from this university, and they're so very proud. Their identity is connected to that. How many of you know that some people are, uh, are very, their identity is based upon uh, the football team that they support? They say, oh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a Liverpool guy, or I, I'm a Manchester United guy, or Chelsea or Tottenham. Uh, a year ago, uh, I was privileged to have my, uh, an associate pastor with me, a young man named Michael, and uh, he probably didn't talk about it too much, but, but privately he had told me I knew this about him. Although he's an American, he's really a serious football fan, soccer fan, serious. And uh, his team is Tottenham. Did I say it right? And, I, and so I told him before we came, I said, well, I said, where are they located? He said, oh, they're on the north side of London. And I said, well, unfortunately, we're going to be on the southeast side of London. So, no, sorry about that. He said, it's okay. I will work it out. So before we even arrived, he had already made plans on Friday morning, he was getting up early. He was getting under, we were staying right here in Croydon. He went, got on the train, went all the way to the other side of London so that he could just go and stand on the pitch. I said, was anybody there? He said, just a janitor. I said, what's, what's the big deal about you just going and standing there? He said, oh, you just don't know. He said, I walked there and I looked around and I went, I'm here. I've arrived. I'm right here. This is where my team plays. This is where well, they had some player named Harry some. Y'all know about this. I don't know about this. Okay. He began to tell me, but he said he was probably standing right there. He was so excited. He came back. He had the store, apparently there's some kind of a store there, and he bought all of the gear. He came back with shirts and jerseys and hats and all of this stuff. And I went, oh, brother, you need prayer. You need, probably need deliverance, probably, on top of the prayer. He had developed a sense of identity. He was so excited about being here, but... He, I told him, I said, I don't think you were as interested in coming with me as you were because Tottenham was here and you were close by. He said, you're right. He developed an identity with that ball, that sports club. Isn't it interesting how we do that? And um, the problem is that many of us, there's nothing wrong with being a Tottenham fan or a Chelsea fan or whatever you are. The real question is, have you and I developed a strong identity what we think of ourselves and who we identify with based upon the promises of God's word. That's the most important identity. And you can have your favorite football team. You can have your favorite university. You can have the company that you work for. You might be a tremendous fan of, but the question really is, who are you in God's eyes? According to scripture, according to scripture, we 
who belong to Jesus Christ, the Bible says that we have been crucified with him and we have been resurrected with him. Many people don't know who they are in Christ. They don't know that the Bible says that we are actually seated, seated with Christ in heavenly places. There's a wonderful book, one of the a little small book that was written many, many years ago that I sometimes give to a new believer. It was by a, a Chinese uh, spiritual leader named Watchman Nee. It's a little book called Sit, Walk, and Stand. Some of you are shaking your head like you're familiar with it. The reason I like to give it is because it talks about being seated before we can walk with Christ, before we can stand against the work of the enemy, we have to know where we're seated. So it tells us from the book of Ephesians where we're seated. But many Christians are uninformed about who we are in Christ. Colossians, for example, in chapter 3 says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So set your minds on things above, not earthly things. All right, so let me give you some benefits of a true identity in Christ. What are some of the benefits of this? There we go. I'm pointing the right way now. Here we go. So I've, I've put them on the screen for you. You can jot them down. Let's just cover them very quickly, and then we'll jump into some other promises from God's word. If you have a true identity as a Christian, you know what God really thinks of you, what will it do for you? What change is it going to make? Number one, it reveals God's true view. It reveals to you in a way that you can understand, but it tells you what really matters. Did you know the most important thing in life is knowing what God says about you? What God thinks of you is more important than what you think of yourself. That the idea is we need to have our own thinking transformed by God's thinking. Viewing yourself as God sees you. That's what really matters. If we could live out an identity based on how God sees us, we would no longer feel the need to find our worth in circumstances or, or money or career or anything of this world because we'd be looking from an eternal perspective. I know many pastors have given the last 30, 40 years to doing a lot of pastoring other pastors, working with people who are early in their ministry years. And one of the traps that I've noticed is that if you're a pastor of a church or you lead a Sunday school class or you're involved in some way in ministry, Many times your identity can get so wrapped up in what you're doing that you become insecure. Because if your identity is wrapped up in your achievement and your accomplishment, it goes up and it goes down. So one Sunday, you have a lot of people, the attendance is up and you walk away going, Look how good I did. I, I'm really feeling good about myself. Next week, the offering is terrible. And the attendance goes down. And you say what? Oh, I'm a failure. Oh, no. What's, what's going on? That person, that leader, has developed an identity based upon their performance. How they think they're doing rather than the identity that's based upon God's opinion. If we can get our identity based on truth and God's view, listen, our life will be far better for it. So please remember that one benefit is it reveals God's true view of you. Number two, it gives us a sense of well-being and peace. If you develop a God perspective of your identity, it will give you a sense of peace, shalom peace, and you will live out your life with that great sense of well-being, like all is well with me and God. All is well. And then from that point on, anything that people say to you, criticisms that come your way, successes or failures or achievements that go up or down, won't matter. Why? Because you are locked in to your true identity. Number three, 
it will create a positive outlook and an attitude of faith. A lot of Christians simply don't know enough of God, what God says about them in order for faith to connect to it. If I walk with true faith in my identity, it will create confidence. It'll change the way I carry myself. It'll change the way I behave. Why? Because I know who I truly am. Number four, it will renew our thought life. It will renew our thought life. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. You know the scripture. It tells us that, that, that our thoughts, our thought life needs to be renewed. We are changed. We are transformed. How? By the renewing of our mind. If you know who you are in Christ, it'll renew your mind. It will affect your thought life and give you that ability to be transformed by God. Number five, it will propel you towards abundant living. We know the promise in John 10, 10, when Jesus said, I've come to, you might have life in life more abundantly. How do we get into abundant life? We do so by learning to identify with Christ. And if we're identified with Christ and we understand that when God views us, he views us through the blood of Jesus Christ. When he looks at you, he looks at you through his eyes and his grace. Identifying with Christ will change the way we live. It'll cause you to rise above adversity. It'll cause you to overcome defeat. Not understanding your identity in him will keep you living far below what your privileges are in Jesus Christ. All of these are benefits, the benefits of truly knowing who you are in Christ. Number six, one more. Number six is that your revelation of your true identity will actually shield you from the enemy's strategies. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 that your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We know we have an enemy. We have an adversary. And he wants to deceive us. He wants to create fear. He wants to create unbelief. He wants to create defeat in our life. He is against you. He is not for you. He is against you. And he is prowling around to find a way to deceive you. But if you are living with an awareness and a revelation of your true identity in Christ, you will learn to be an overcomer over all of Satan's strategies. His strategies will not work in your, against you because you know the truth. It will literally shield you. For example, the, the problem that the enemy uses quite often is, is the attack, the strategy of fear, right? He'll try to create fear in you about something, but if you know who you are in Christ, you know that you're an overcomer. You say, well, I don't feel like I'm overcoming. But that's the way God views you. He views you as an overcomer. That mindset will allow you to dispel the fear that the enemy tries to grip you with. For example, many Christians are overcome with a sense of insecurity or unworthiness. They don't pray because they don't feel accepted by God. They don't worship God in a way of freedom because they're not sure that it's okay. They don't spend time in the presence of God because they're living under condemnation and they're feeling insecure in God's presence. But if you know the truth of your identity, you will know that you were made worthy by the blood of the Lamb. The, the Bible declares that you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that you're in right standing. That will allow you to feel Faith and confidence to pray. Confidence to stand in the presence of God. Why? Because the blood of the Lamb has paved the way for you to enter into God's presence. Therefore, you can come boldly and with confidence into the presence of God. Do you see how a true identity that's based upon God's promises will change the way you think? It'll change the way you live. It will shield you from Satan's strategies in your life. When you identify with Jesus Christ, not just to get eternal life, 
but truly identify with Jesus Christ and accept his new identity that he has given to you, it will affect everything about the way you live. From my experience, new believers, one of the most important foundations that they need to receive, and I know many of you have been walking with God for a long time, but a new believer needs to learn their position in Christ, who they are in Christ, their true identity. Unfortunately, many of us are not taught that as a young believer. And many Christians I'm finding today, I talk to people who have been following the Lord for years, and they still don't have a good grasp of what their identity is. And because they don't have a good grasp of what God says about them, they then tend to what? They develop identity based on other things. It's an identity based upon nationality. It's an identity based upon their job. It's an identity based upon their football team. Surely there has to be something more important. But they're uninformed. They're not taught. And so I thought, why not tonight? Let me just remind you. And some of you, this is just going to be remembering. Some of you, it may be fresh. You might think, I don't know that I've ever heard it said that way. I don't know that I've ever put it together that way. So for those of you that this is, you know, it, it seems to be uh, material that you already know, uh, forgive me for that, but I believe it will benefit all of us. So let's look at what God's true view of us in Christ is. And I'm just going to give you six aspects. These are the most fundamental aspects of your identity in Christ. So remember what I said. The condition is this. You simply have to say, I have already identified with Christ. In other words, that happened when you became a child of God, when you were born again. I know that. So if you can say here with me tonight, I know I've already identified with Jesus Christ. I put my faith in him. That's me. Raise your hand. Say, I already know that. Okay, 98% of you tonight. If that is true, something took place when you were born again that you may not even realize. You were put into a new position. You were placed in Christ. In Christ. When you read the New Testament, notice in the epistles how many times the scripture talks about us and it says, you who are in Christ, by Christ, with Christ. Do you know why it's saying that? Because it's speaking to us as people who have received a new position. We now have taken ourselves out of the realm of darkness. We've put our faith in Jesus Christ and God puts us, unifies us with Christ. We are in Christ from that moment on. That is a glorious truth, isn't it? We are in Christ. And every believer is in Christ, whether they know it or not. Once you are in Christ, you need to learn being in Christ. What does that mean for me? What does this new position look like? What are the uh, the, the facets, the dimensions, the aspects of being in Christ. So let me offer to you six of those. You ready for them? Here we go. Number one. Number one is, and I'm putting these in a declarative statement form, all right? So in each of these, because it'll help you to, to learn it. So the first one is, I am accepted. I am accepted completely accepted. So could you maybe just start off by saying that with me? Say, I'm accepted. I am accepted. You are declaring what God thinks about you. You are declaring your true identity. Not what someone else thinks about you. Not what you feel about yourself from time to time. But this is the truth based upon what? God's promises. Now, how do we know that we're accepted? Because you've been chosen by God himself. Because God has chosen you before the worlds were created. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6, 4 and 6, it says the same thing. It says this, he chose us in him. God chose us in him. Notice that again, in him, in Christ. You see that? He chose us in him before 
the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight by his love. Stop. Think about this. You were chosen, accepted by God, the creator of the universe. Before he created the universe, he has chosen to accept you. Someone say amen tonight. That's good news, isn't it? If God chose me before I was ever created, God knew to accept me, to choose me, and to choose you, and to, that you're acceptable. Because what? Because he did it through Christ. Christ was the co-person of the Godhead. The Son of God was a part of creation. So Ephesians tells us that we, we've already been chosen. God choosing you means that you're accepted. The second reason we know that we've been accepted is because Jesus has made us acceptable. The Bible says, for example, in Titus chapter 3 and verse 7 says, Jesus treated us much better than we deserve. He made us acceptable to God and gave us the hope of eternal life. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is what? In Christ. See it again? So the condition is what? You have to be in Christ. How do you get in Christ? Not by being good. You don't get to be in Christ by being a church member. You're in Christ because of what? Salvation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. Skip down a little bit later in that same chapter and it says, He made Christ who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. So that in him, did you see that again? So in him, we would become the righteousness of God. Meaning, we would be in right standing with God. One translation says, that is, we would be made acceptable to him and we would be placed in a right relationship with him. That's what happens. Christ, Jesus Christ, took your unworthiness so that you could be accepted. Jesus on the cross, when he took your sin, he took my sin, was rejected by his father so that you could be accepted. What a sacrifice. He was rejected so you and I could be accepted. If that is true, I can walk today knowing what? I am accepted. You're accepted because you are worthy. God has made you worthy through the blood of Jesus Christ. What an incredible truth that is, that you have been completely accepted. That truth will change the way that you live. It'll change the way you behave. It'll change the way you function in life, learning that you have been accepted. Number two, the second truth that I want you just to really get down deep inside is the fact that you are extremely valuable. Here we go. I am extremely valuable. What do I mean by this? You need to see yourself through God's eyes that you are valuable. The scripture tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 7, you are a people that is holy unto the Lord. You are his treasured possession. Now, God is speaking to the nation of Israel, to the Jewish people. And he said, you are priceless. You are treasured possession. God, Yahweh's treasured possession. You're a people that belong to God. Why can we view that about ourselves today? First of all, because God is my heavenly father. God is your heavenly father. Luke chapter 12 and verse 24 says, look at the birds. You remember this when Jesus said this? Look at the birds, 
how that God my father feeds them and they are far more valuable than him. You are far more valuable to him than any of these birds. Do you see how valuable his creation is to him? You and I, according to Jesus, we are more valuable than that. Why? Because God is our father. And if he's your father and you're in the family of God by the grace and the love of God, friend, you can walk away knowing that you're valued. You are valued. You are special. The second reason that we can know that we're extremely valuable is because Jesus has given his life for you and me. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 23. One translation says, you have been bought and paid for by Christ. You have been bought and paid for by Christ. Therefore, you belong to him. The Bible uses the word redeemed. You have been redeemed. You have been bought. God bought you through his son, Jesus Christ. The price of buying you was what? The life of his only son, Jesus Christ. That was the life that paid for your redemption, for mine. I can stand and say, I am redeemed. He gave his life for me. He hung on that cross for me. Personalize it. It's for me. Why? Because I'm valuable. And through his life, and his death, you have been made extremely valuable. The third reason we can know that we're very valuable is because God created you with a purpose. Scripture tells us in Ephesians that we are God's masterpiece. The scripture that says that you are his workmanship. We are God's masterpiece. In Christ Jesus, God has created us made us to do good works, which God has planned in advance for us to live our lives to do. What does this tell me? That when God created you and he created me, he not only chose you and accepted you, but he created you with a purpose and a destiny. Every single one of us. He has a divine purpose. The obvious question is, are you living in God's purpose? But God created you for a purpose. You say, well, why is that important? Because if God created you for a purpose, don't you think that that means that you're valuable? Yes, you're valued simply because God calls you his masterpiece, his workmanship. The word in the Greek language there in Ephesians is actually a word that has to do with a, a piece of poetry that is written. You're a special piece of art special you know what they do with priceless pieces of artwork and statues they put them in museums people travel miles to see special pieces of art and yet here the bible is saying that you and i that we are the workmanship of god he has created you and me we are his piece of artwork and we're beautiful Hallelujah. God has made you with a purpose. I'm extremely valuable. Can you say, I'm extremely valuable? Say that with me. I am extremely valuable. Doesn't matter how you feel. We're talking about truths tonight. We're talking about facts that are based upon the promises of God, not feelings. Facts. It takes faith. To accept the facts. But these are facts from God's perspective. Who do you think's opinion is more important? Yours or God's? If God's opinion is what matters, then let's put aside our own defeatism, our own feelings about ourselves, our past or our future, and just say, I'm valuable. I'm no longer, young, young people today, you know, one of the, I, I, I'm not sure I don't know the statistics in, in Britain. But I know it's true in America. One of the most common problems we have today with young people, teenagers, youth, are forms of self-destruction. We took a survey not too long ago, uh, a, a very uh, anonymous type of a survey among our young people in our youth group from 
from 11 years old all the way through 18 years old. You know, we found that 25% of them had been cutting themselves over the past 12 months. You say, well, why would someone cut themselves? It's, it's more common than you realize. The things that young people do today, you know why they're doing that? They don't like themselves. They're hurting themselves out of a, because they don't know the truth. And it's some way that they can express how they're feeling, those negative, angry feelings. The need to control is expressed by some very sad things. But if we could simply realize that Jesus Christ is the answer, and once I identify with him, I realize that I'm valuable, and I can reject the lies of the enemy. Amen? All right, let's look at number three. Number three, I am a member of God's family. Say it with me. Say, I'm a member of God's family. Now, is this based upon the truth of God's word? Yes, it is. Let me give you an example. Two scriptures. Ephesians 1, 5 says, because of his love, God has already decided to make us his own children through Jesus Christ. He's already decided to make you one of his own. Galatians chapter 4. Jesus came to redeem those under the law that we might receive, what? Adoption to sonship. Through Jesus Christ, he made available for you and for me adoption. What is adoption? It's a matter of including someone in your family. It's taking someone who was on the outside and saying, now we're bringing you on the inside of our family. You can take our name. You take our reputation. You get an inheritance as a part of our family. If you've, I have quite a number of friends that were adopted into families. And now they've grown and they're married and they have a special appreciation for adoption because they were adopted. Can you imagine just realizing that there was the chance that I might not have been adopted? The fact that you could have been adopted into a, a really bad situation? But you and me, we have the privilege of knowing that we've been adopted into God's family and spiritually adopted. An adopted son, and he clarifies in that scripture, adoption to sonship. Speaking of our status as sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ, we are on the same footing with Jesus' position because we've been adopted. That's good news. That is really good news. Because if I'm adopted, I'm in his family. I know you know this, but there are a lot of people today, I hear it all the time. Uh, people are talking about, you know, well, we're all God's children. And isn't it great to be, you know, God's children? Here recently in, in my country, there was a tragic um, and a very important American football game, which wouldn't be important to anybody outside of my country. But it was a very important football game that had uh, implications for our championships. There was a tragic accident. This actually was very similar to something that happened in the Premier League, uh, in, I don't remember, 10 years ago or something. But one of the football players just fell over, not as a result of an injury, just fell over on the field and had a heart attack. It was, we did, they didn't know, but immediately all the medical personnel ran out and he died. He, they had to bring him back to life on the field. And everybody in the whole stadium was watching this. It was on national TV. Everyone is glued to their TV. And you could see the medical personnel reviving him, applying, um, you know, life-saving measures. And they said he literally would have died if the medical personnel wouldn't have been just right there. Then immediately, it took 40 minutes. 40 minutes of the game was on pause. And all the players were on their knees well, isn't this amazing? And over the next two or three days, the only thing anybody in our country could talk about was this football player who had possibly died. We didn't know for maybe a whole day whether he was going to live. 
And they brought him back in the hospital, took him to the emergency, brought him back. And they found out that it was a certain very rare heart condition that because of, a, because of an incident on the field, he, he would have died. I couldn't believe over the next two days, everything that you could see on social media, everything you could see on, on TV was, everybody was saying the same thing. We're praying for you. We're praying. We're sending prayers to you, Dana. I said to my friends, I didn't know that that many people in America knew how to pray. <laughs> and you know what I realized? They really didn't. These are people who simply out of desperation didn't know what else to do. The players on both teams, everybody was on their knees praying. Why? Because they were concerned about their friend. They were concerned about a fellow player. I thought to myself, isn't it amazing how all it takes is even not happening to you personally, someone you don't even know. And all of a sudden you feel the need to pray. Meaning they're looking somewhere. They're looking for help somewhere. They're not. Most of those people are not praying out a personal relationship. They're just trying to do something. And I thought to myself, wow, what an opportunity for us to help people understand. Do you remember how you felt? When Damon fell to the field, do you remember that? Do you remember how you felt the need to reach out to something greater than yourself? You remember? Wouldn't you like to actually be one member of God's own family? Wouldn't you like to be an adopted son or daughter of God's family? So that if any time you ever faced a crisis, you could go directly to God with the assurance of knowing I'm his child. He's listening to me. He's adopted me into his family. It's quite a wake-up call. I'm a member of God's family. Are you? Number four. There we go. Number four. I am totally free. Can you say it? I'm totally free. Is that what the Bible says? There's amazing promises that tell us this. For example, Romans 8, 17. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. No, we, we've been released from the fear, the fear of freedom from the penalty of sin, freedom from the power of sin, freedom from bondages through Jesus Christ. We're no longer slaves. We're no longer in bondage. Instead, Galatians 5 verse 13 says, you, my brothers and sisters, Paul says, you were called to be free. You are called to freedom, not bondage. You're called to be free, free from curses, free from sin's control, free from addictions, free to live for Christ. Freedom is a part of of your identity. Galatians 5.1 says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It's for freedom. So don't let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. I am totally free. How about you? Number five. I'm going to give you two more. Five and six. Five. I am an overcomer. I am an overcomer. Say it with me. I am an overcomer. Now remember, we're not just making up things here. We're just saying what God says about you. This is your new position that is true the moment you accept Jesus Christ. Let's look at what the scripture says. What are the promises? 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 and verse 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. Verse 5, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. <coughs> Even our faith. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 says what? No, in all these things, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who 
loved us. Do you hear what Paul's talking about? Being a more than a conqueror? That there's no circumstance, there's no enemy that can rule and dominate you because you're an overcomer. You're victorious through Jesus Christ. It's not of your own effort. It's not because of your own genius. It's because of what Christ has done for you. And when God sees you today, he sees you as an overcomer. He sees you as an overcomer. I have recently been teaching a lot from some different scriptures in the Old Testament. And it's amazing how often men and women who were greatly used of God felt very inferior, like they were a failure. And uh, you may remember the story in the Old Testament of Gideon. Now that Gideon was from the least of all the tribes. He was a nobody. And yet, you know what God said to him? You remember what God said to him? You mighty man of valor. I'm sure Gideon was like, a, me? I don't feel like a man of valor. I don't feel like a great victor. I don't feel like a great Mighty hero, that's what the word means, mighty hero. I don't feel like that at all. I'm just good old Gideon. God said, oh no, you're a mighty hero. See, God's perspective of you may be different than the way you feel about yourself. Some of us have been raised in environments where we have been told that we are losers. That's why we have to retrain our minds. With the word of God. Because God says. You're an overcomer. So we have to. Align ourselves with this truth. Let me give you one more. And we're done. One more tonight. Number six. I am fully capable. I am fully capable. You know the scripture that I chose to assure this. It's a promise. Say it first. Say I am fully capable. Yeah, where's the scripture? Philippians 4.13, right? I can do everything, anything. How? Through my own strength? No, through Christ. Through Christ who gives me strength. That means if I'm in Christ, that I have access to being fully capable, fully able to do whatever is set before me, even situations and circumstances that seem impossible for me, I can address them. Why? Because of Christ. I'm in Christ, and through him, he will give me strength. There's nothing in your life that you're not capable through Christ of overcoming, dealing with the ability, the supernatural ability in whatever situation you're in is available to you. These six aspects of what it means to be in Christ. Speak of your true identity. We have to adjust our identity away from earthly things, away from our past, and we have to lock in our identity with what God says about us. What God says about you is the most important thing. Could you tonight, as you stand to your feet, I'm going to pray for you. Because I believe that there are many of us here tonight that need to have a little adjustment. <laughs> we need to adjust ourselves to God's view. We have maybe accepted our own feelings, or we've accepted the lies of the enemy, or we've accepted what other people have said about us. How many of you know that other people have said things about you that aren't true? So what we must do? We must reject that, and we must accept what God says about us. That is your true identity. If you're here tonight and you've been struggling maybe with your identity, with how you feel about yourself, and you realize that maybe it has been disadvantageous to you, maybe it's been harmful to you, but tonight you with me would like to make a decision. Say from tonight on, I'm going to begin to acquaint myself with God's perspective, 
with what God says about me based upon these promises. And I'm going to begin to walk in my identity in Christ from this moment on. How many feel that way tonight and you would like me to pray for you and with you tonight? Would you just raise your hand and say, I've been struggling with that. I've got an issue in that. It causes all of us to behave in different ways. But if you've got an issue with it, God's going to help you tonight. Shall we pray together? I'm praying specifically for those of you who raised your hands. Lord Jesus, I come to you tonight in prayer of faith for these who've acknowledged that they're struggling with how they're viewing themselves. And because of that, they're not living an abundant life. Lord God, I pray for them that from this moment forward, they be would begin to choose your opinion, your promises, that we are valuable, that we are accepted, that we are members of your family, that we are forgiven, that we are free, that we are capable, fully capable of whatever is put in front of us. Lord, I pray that you would adjust our thinking, renew our minds, and cause us to walk in victory with these truths in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you tonight. We'll see you tomorrow.